And with Ange, from the beginning, you felt this is going to be good, right? If you give the ball away, if you make a technical mistake, it's it's not a problem. Yeah, Sonny's one of my best friends and is he, he? we've played together for ages. He's the godfather of my son. Can you talk to us a little bit about Posh? We were going to games, we knew each other like the back of our hands. It felt, felt very easy at times. We had some pretty high profile managers after that. The face down from the unknown number, I'm like, who is this? So I answer and it's Jose. First words to me are, are you One thing that I think is, is, is pretty neat, just, just about the present this season. You get a new manager in, and you've had five, six new managers at Spurs alone. Yep. Um, and people always wonder, how's it going to work, blah, blah, blah. And it's fair to say Ange Postacoglu probably didn't have the, 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 the CV of, the, of, of a Conte or a Mourinho before him. Um, and you've, you've done well. You've gotten a lot of plaudits this season. Does everything, just from, just from a more of a footballer's perspective, does how much do things change from one manager to the other in terms of in terms of training day to day work? Yeah, I think there's that um, unknown feeling you get as a player more than anything when um, when a new manager comes in. Uh, you get a lot of text messages flying around. Who's it going to be? Who, who's going <laughs> to come in? And we play the game just like everybody else. You see the news on the TV, or we wait until that announcement comes. And I think somebody like and Postacoglu was was someone who stirred excitement within within our team because we knew the success he'd had at Celtic and the exciting brand of football we played. And I think that's what people wanted to get to at um, at Spurs this season was trying to play an exciting brand of football, an attacking brand of football, and hopefully start winning some games again. And yeah. um, and I think from day one we saw in the training since he's come in. That's been the whole philosophy. It's been fast-paced. It's been everything with the ball. It's been dynamic. And I think we're enjoying what we're seeing out on the pitch. Is there, is there a bit of apprehension when you know there's a new guy coming? So if someone has been signed, yeah. there'll be a replacement or in the summer because you just don't know and you're hoping that it's one that suits your style maybe or you would rather a bigger name or not a bigger name or someone that you've worked with before or someone completely new. Is there a bit of that or you just go along and wait for the club to decide? No, I think completely. I think um, you'd be very naive to think that every manager is going to like you as a player <laughs> um, and you you have no idea if he does or he doesn't until yeah. he comes in to that door. So, yeah, I think, of course, there's apprehension um, when a new manager comes in. Um, you don't know what that manager thinks about you, yeah. ultimately. Um, and it's important that on day one, you're going in there hoping that you're there to impress. I'm sure he came in knowing what he had in the team. Uh, it's not like we're an unknown bunch of players, yeah. but... You don't know if you fit in his system, if you're in his plans going forward. So that feeling's always there, but I think that's why we have a preseason. That's why we had that time with him to to stake our claim for why we want to be part of his squad going forward. And it was a good preseason. We went away. Mm-hmm. It was um, it was intense, but as I said, it's all with the ball, and I think that's all professional players want it's to do. like when you meet a girl it's just there's this no it's true there's this time where you get to know each other right you individually yeah. with the manager and everybody with the same and then collectively as a group with that manager as well hopefully not collectively with the girl no no I mean <laughs> you know what I mean like, just like you very open minded it's like a date you're dating and see if you like each yeah, other you're putting your best face forward right? <laughs> Yeah, except you're under contract. It's more like an arranged no, no, marriage I know, here, but still, right? Benny's right, though. If the guy doesn't like you, then you need to get but, out of that. But how does he, or, I mean, have they all been the same? Because I'm imagining, like, in a corporate structure, right? Mm-hmm. Like, if my department, if we were to get a new boss, he would come and he would meet with all of us yeah. collectively and then meet with all of us individually and stuff. Is that what all your new managers have done? Have they said, all right, you know, do you, like, schedule a time and you go and you talk to him for 20 minutes, half an hour individually in addition to what you do. Is that, that seems pretty standard. Uh, it seems standard, but that's not real. That's not what I've ever experienced in football. Really? I've that's never crazy. experienced a manager coming in and um, having one-to-ones with everyone. Um, I told this to a couple of friends and they were also surprised at that <laughs> as well. But it's more a meeting as a collective. And 
and really it came down to watching us on the training pitch that's that's probably the first real interaction you get um we had meetings as a team of what was expected what behaviors were expected um how you can be successful in my system but there are no real one-on-ones okay. where you you know air your concerns or ask where you stand i think that's something that the manager will look at and make his decision probably over time so with Ange, from mm-hmm. the beginning you felt this is going to be good right yeah well he comes in he puts good training sessions on yeah. he speaks incredibly well he gets you excited for the season ahead and that's all you want as a player you want to feel that excitement of what could lie ahead and um yeah he put that with into us straight yeah. away and with others would I have been maybe different from the beginning you could see like okay this is going to be slightly different way of working than I had before or the beginning is always a bit everybody's nice everybody's happy everything and it's maybe later down the road or you see like it's not as I good think as every it new manager coming in you will have that feeling of mm. of change yeah and with that change comes that exciting feeling if you feel like you're going to be part of the plan. So, yeah, yeah. And thankfully, with all the managers that I've had at Spurs, I've I've had that feeling. And I've been lucky to work with some great guys that have come in at that club. And and it's a big opportunity to learn. Yeah. We've had some of the best names in world football managers. So to even be a part of that, it, you have to sometimes take a step back and be appreciative of who you've worked under. Yeah. All right. I want to move on from Andrew, but I have to ask you this because this is something you've, you've told me before, which I didn't know, which blew me away about him. Most managers have their, they have like their posse of, of assistants, especially some of the guys who've managed, oh. who've managed Spurs. <laughs> I'm thinking specifically of Pochettino and Conte. You know, somebody, somebody like Mourinho, maybe in some ways a victim of his success because you'll have a group of assistants and then you know, uh, they want to branch on their own. Um, Villas Boas leaves, Refire leaves, so you replace them with other people. But, you know, these other guys have like a tight-knit posse of people who are around them, who know their methods, who, you know, sit around, hang out with them. Ange does not. He has a bunch of assistants at Celtic, maybe he had other people before. Comes to you guys, and not only is his impact with you new, but his impact with most of his staff is new. That... That seems really counterintuitive. And again, to tie it back to the corporate word, in case some big corporation wants to see a case Accenture, in case you want to sponsor us. Uh, <laughs> no, but most people, right, when they move from one corporation to one company to the other, yeah. they, they have their trusted lieutenants who they bring along. And Was that weird for you? Was that, had you experienced that before? I'd never experienced that before. It, it was unusual. And, you know, we had a whole new coaching department come in as well we had ryan mason and matt wells who had been there before um but you knew us. those guys at least. so we yeah. knew those guys right. but he also brought in mele jedinak chris davis yeah and on mele played under uh Ange, but had never Could never coached, coached under him uh, <laughs> and so chris funny. was completely separate so yeah it was unusual for us but I and mean, obviously he'd never worked with with wells or or mason either no, right no but what was really impressive is from day one, his his message was clear, um, his values were very clear, and it, it flowed perfectly. Uh, the training was very good, overseen by by the manager, and to this day, I think it's worked very well. Um, his voice is final, and you know that we're all following what he believes in, but it keeps everybody on their toes. Uh, I think it keeps the coaches on their toes as well. They're, they're there to work hard and to be, to put their best shoe forward because they're a team within a team, if that makes sense. Right. So but you, it's very different to what I've experienced before. Yeah, I was going to say, all how the different? coaches I've had have all had people who maybe have learned a structure, a system, maybe have a one message that, you know, may have taken three, four years of time working together just to, so that the manager will trust them to be able to deliver yeah. that. But it's been very unusual, but it's been very successful. I think, you know, I look into coaching after I finish football and and I'm not sure I would have the the confidence to go into somewhere alone. It, it's, it's impressive. 
I, I wonder when you've got a tight knit staff, you can sometimes get a, a bunch of yes men, not yes men, but like, you know, when they're so dependent on you, you know, you're the star, you're the manager. On the other hand, you have a uniformity of message, right? They know you, they know you're, you're good mm-hmm. more, you know, with Ange, like, does he bring these guys in saying like, oh, well, these guys don't have any real loyalty to me, just they have loyalty to their job. So they can contradict me. They can say, Ange, that's stupid. And here's why. And then we have a discussion. It's my decision. But <laughs> but, I, but I welcome that that dialogue. I mean, do you think it's that or do you, do you not? I guess you wouldn't know. Look, I don't know. <laughs> <Right>. but, <laughs> but so far, it seems to be working. Right. I think having, for this is not necessarily directly for Spurs, but not having uh, that staff that follows you everywhere, I guess it, probably stops the level any level of complacency seeping mm-hmm. in as well right i think yeah, you know you it. could it, it's sometimes difficult if you're with a group for 10 15 years or your whole career you know there might be times where it's hard to say to someone this is wrong this is not yeah. how you do it right whereas if you have people who have come in working for you and maybe you have more more right or more leadership to be able to say that kind of stuff but it's uh it's definitely interesting and in terms of his methods, then what's mm-hmm. what's the biggest difference that you saw? What is his philosophy, or what? How could you sum up everything that he brought so far in the space of what? Let's say six months. Yeah, I think we probably forget that it's only been six yeah. months that he's been with us. He's implemented a style of play and a philosophy into us very quickly. But really, this philosophy is just we want to have the ball at every opportunity we can, and we want to not dally on the ball we're not keeping the ball for the sake of it yeah. we're keeping the ball to create opportunities and probably pulling those extra guys inside like we've played with the fullbacks inside has more bodies in there gives you more options to play the pass and gives you opportunity to get it to the forward players as quickly as possible and this season that dynamism we've had in midfield the, the rotations we've had fullbacks playing up front in yeah. games it did it, it it works when everybody's brave and he gives us that courage to just play at all costs. If you give the ball away, if you make a technical mistake, it's it's not a problem. It's going to happen. Um, you can concede a goal from a bad pass, for example, but the way that I see it is you can also concede a goal from getting a free kick, smashing it long. Yeah. Team wins a header and they've gone and scored because everybody's spread out. So, yeah, But then nobody that, calls you naive when that nobody happens. Nobody calls That's you naive, different... <laughs> yeah. but... If, I, if you look at the amount of goal, if you if you're taking a goal kick, this is how I would interpret it. If you're taking a goal kick, everybody's spread out. We've gone just smashed it long. Um, the argument would be that the team that's most likely to score is the team that isn't taking the goal kick. Yeah. You're not going to score from back here by smashing it long and then a flick on and then you've ran past three or four people. You probably expect that the chances are. A big centre half's going to come and head the ball. It could land to the striker. He can score straight away. So if you're going to take those risks, why not take risks and try and to do something that's going to give you the opportunity to score at the other end? And was that easy to implement? With is it easy? Uh, like um, because he explains it so well and he gives you that confidence. Extra, is it easy, or was it still complicated for you or others to actually understand where your position should be when the ball is there? When we move forward like that, I have to be here. I guess especially more for the fullbacks, maybe. Yeah. So for Pedro to come inside a lot. I mean, Madison, I think, was helping everybody, to be fair, seeing how good he was. But was it easy in the end or it took a bit of time still? Um, look, there were games where you maybe were a bit rigid mm-hmm. uh, in preseason, just trying to figure out kind of how far to take it you know as a fullback do you really want to go to the other side of the pitch to receive the ball well if this is all new to most people you'd feel like you're leaving your position but you know after every game we'd review it after training sessions we would review it and you saw the good actions that were being shown usually were when players were completely free you'd see a fullback find a position that was completely different to what you'd see from probably any other fullback in the league or you'd see Madison dropping into a left back position and the fact that that was all encouraged I think over time people realized then I'm actually free to go anywhere here there's maybe two or three players in this team that are pretty stuck in their yeah. positions you your two wingers need to be high and wide to be able to pin their fullbacks so that's that's what you ask of them yep okay because they're you see in our system they don't change they're always there they're on the last line 
and probably your center backs because yeah. you can't really be going wherever you want for <laughs> obvious reasons. So, but that rest of the midfield five that play in there, go wherever you want, rotate as much as you want because it's about creating challenges for the opposition. Yeah. If you're an if you're the opposite opposite winger, usually you look in your vision you see a full back there can you make it difficult for him to yeah. defend and you've we've seen we've played games i think we play in city and earlier in the season and there was a time in the game where we had pedro and destiny were basically like two number 10s two strikers even and the people marking them were foden and doku yeah well in that case <laughs> like because diaz had gone and followed our striker because the other center back had jumped in and followed here it meant that you know, if you look, stop the frame right there, you're playing two attacking fullbacks against two wingers, two v two. And yeah. those are the kind of situations you want to try and create. Can you talk to us a little bit about Posh? What he meant to you for your career? What what made him special at the time, especially at Spurs? Um, like you know, all of that, all the the things maybe we we didn't know from just watching outside or analyzing the game. Yeah, I think he was one of the big reasons I signed for Tottenham. Um, I'd, I'd met him. He'd explained his vision uh, in pretty broken English at the time, yeah, but yeah. you could get the the feeling of what he wanted to do. Um, Peter, was it broken English? He thought when he was at Southampton, he was pretending not to speak English, and so he needing that that, that translator. But no, I think I it, it, it wasn't. He was learning. Yeah, right. he was like, learning. And right. I I understand why he did it. I don't think if I went to. Spain and I'd have to try and uh, have a go then I'm sure I'd be using the translator <laughs> if I could right so he, he was a big reason why I went there and he uh, he really had a vision and looking back at it now not many you know you, as a manager you don't know how long you're going to get now you could be there yeah. a couple of months and this but th this was a semi long term vision of how he wanted the club to play where he expected me to fit in in that team and where we were going to go and I think it was a big difference from where I was at at Swansea and the way we trained, the professionalism that he brought in, the the demands he put on players. It was, it was a it was a change of lifestyle more than anything. This was someone who someone who cared what you did at home. Yeah, found out what you did at home. Really, it, it was it was intense, but it was exactly what you needed to do to be a professional footballer. And he introduced proper gym work not heavy weights but stuff that was related to football the training was intense it was sharp it was 2v2s 3v3s it had certain days but it was all blocked it was very well managed and and i think that season we were we were so confident in the way we were playing maybe not the first season but the second season whenever when everything came to fruition yeah we were going into games knowing we'd won before we turned up really yeah it it, it felt very easy at times and this wasn't, you know, a manager went in depth tactically about the opposition. There, there were loads of games where we went into games, no meetings on the opposition. Literally three hours before when we arrived at the stadium, there'd be a, a short meeting. Um, this is who we're up against. This is their set pieces, and this is how we play, which really? didn't so really change. But it's all about us. The it was, was we you, were the yeah. focus. It wasn't uh, an opposition focused mentality and. We were going to games. We knew each other like the back of our hands. It felt felt very easy at times. Dele Alli, mm -hmm. like the the Ben Davies that played with Dele Alli, that was a magician those seasons, really. Because we don't need to talk about what happened to him now. And it's, it's a sad story, but I, I we don't know what happened. I'm not sure if you do. So anyway, let's focus on when he was actually really good. Yeah. Could you see him when he arrived? So he arrived from Milton Keynes. Mm -hmm. Could you see that development in him and him going from this talented, promising kid to this outstanding, one of the best in the league kind of player? Delhi was was incredible when he turned up. He was a young kid from Milton Keynes and he got thrown into first team training and he would just do stuff. It was like playing for fun. And I think to start with, the management, the staff probably were like, this kid doing like play properly get the ball play here like he was playing because what was he doing like he was like, just... he would just like s ball comes to feet step over it try to go through other people's legs sometimes it worked sometimes it didn't trying to flick the ball and at this time I remember he was playing as a six he was yeah. like a, a cdm like he was he'd fly into tackles and training and you'd get some boys be like relax but 
<laughs> but then we went pre-season again, went, yeah. played against Real Madrid and it was the daily show from that. And this was a kid who, there was no difference in level of opposition. That's probably the best way I'd describe it. He, what he did in League One, he would try and do against Modric, yeah. against Cruz, these guys. It was it was irrelevant who he was playing against. He had the self-confidence. I think he's spoken about it, which is like the bravery. It doesn't mean he wasn't nervous about trying these things, but he had the bravery to try it. And yeah. that never went away from him. And, and when he, that season, when he just was breaking through, scoring goals for fun. God, the one at Palace. Remember the one at Palace goals. when he like, chased the ball and who, then going Who even tries that? that yeah, that's exactly. the reality. Yeah, and just... that's, that's what he was doing. It's It was insane. But big thing that I think we didn't appreciate the time was how good off the ball he was for us. Yeah. If you watch those games back, man, our team couldn't press without Delhi. Yeah. He was hounding the goalkeeper, hounding the centre back, hounding the centre midfielders. He was dropping back, winning tackles. And I've said it to him many times. I'd love to see him go back to playing a bit deeper, playing as a six, go back, take the pressure of trying to get assists or goals out of your game and go back being that tough tackling, hungry yeah. young kid who was winning the ball. Like he's still incredibly fit yeah like yeah, yeah. he could run all day he used to run more than anybody he'd he'd have the summer of doing nothing come back for preseason to be the fittest guy he'd win <laughs> really? every fitness test and i'd love to see him get back in that role but did you think he could become one of the best in the world did you think after those seasons that like sky there's no limit for there him, was really? no limit for him he could have at that time been similar to like a bellingham kind yeah, of player yeah, yeah. now someone who maybe not technically as good as judas but Ultimately, the game comes down to scoring goals. Yeah, Delhi used to yes, find a has, way yeah. to score and assist pretty much every game, and he used to he used to just cause nightmares for opposition midfield. I remember speaking to Joe Allen at uh, at Wales camp, and him being like, "Delhi just didn't stop running." He was like, "He was horrible to play against because one minute he was here, and the next minute he's already <laughs> twenty yards away from me, and I don't know whether I should follow him." I get the ball, I think I'm free, and Delhi's already on yeah, me. It was yeah. just a guy who just never stopped. I don't think we appreciated enough the Delhi Ali Ooh. because of everything that happened after, which again is sad. But I don't think people gave him enough credit for for being that good so young at no. that time. He's got 50 no. Premier League goals. Yeah, there brilliant. are some there are some midfielders we talk about now as having incredible careers that are nowhere near those yeah. numbers. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not saying the game just ultimately comes out in numbers, you promise, but. What he did in that period was agree, was in, insane. You had some before we get to go to Wales. Just, you had some pretty high profile managers after that, mm -hmm. Antonio Conte and Jose Mourinho. And I was actually thinking, those are two of the most polarizing, most kind of visible um, managers. People people always have an opinion on them, and they're like, "Oh, he always says this. Hey, oh, he's always like this. He's always like that." Whereas when Pochettino arrived, you know, he was a He's become a big manager now, but at the time, you know, he was yeah. a guy from Southampton and Espanol and whatever. Whereas when these guys walked in, they were already established. Did that change the dynamic a little? Because when you had Brendan before, he was kind of relatively unknown. Mm -hmm. Ladra had never worked in this country. Is it is it a different dynamic when they walk in? Do you get the sense that they actually... Is, it, is Jose walked in and said like, yeah, yeah. It's a different dynamic. <laughs> and also, ah. they represent big investments for the club as well. So inevitably, if I'm a club and I'm going to invest in a Conte or a Mourinho, I'm going to give them a lot of... I'm going to give them support because yep. I'm stupid not to. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sim the Jose one was my first experience and this was, it was during international break and I remember I walked off the pitch and I got a text being like, Jose's in, new manager. And it was a shock to us. We'd been with Pochettino for five years. He was, you know, the figurehead of the club. He was in control of most things. And I remember getting told, I think we'd just qualified that night for the Euros actually with Wales, but I had to get back for the next month. Next day, Jose was there. And uh, around that first meeting, he basically just read the rights to us that, yeah, you guys, you might think you're good, but... You're not necessarily as good as you think you are. Um, and this is Jose. Jose's voice carries, you know. It, it's the guy we've grown up listening to yeah. on, the, on the TV. They were guy, we obviously knew that played a more physical. A more, we had guys completely nervous about their size. I'm going to put a rain jacket on so they think I'm bigger. That, that, this really? level is crazy, That's, right? Really, we players actually <laughs> think that way. some fear. Of course. There's the, like they, we talked about like, earlier, oh. there's the apprehension, the fear of, you know, and a new manager needs to... Like like me to play me. 
No, but also just the size thing. Because I mean, I mean, that was a thing with Jose many years ago. But people, but players actually think, oh, you have to be at least like six foot tall to play. Or what? I'm not in every player's head, but I'm sure it was a thought. Yeah, and I would so, agree. So, Definitely. firstly, you're in there. Jose is such a big presence around the place. You hear his voice coming down the corridor. We sit in the meeting. We go straight out to train. We've got a game two days later. So we do some sort of passing drill. But what's different is straight away he wanted to engage with everyone. No filter. Would tell people you've seen in the documentary when yeah. he's like no filter. Tell people everything. He said to me, I came back from where he's like, did you have some beers last night about was qualifying? And I was like, no, I had to drive back to come here. And he's like, ah, okay, whatever. He's like, next time. And, but we short build up. He basically is honest as I don't know really what what I'm team, but I haven't watched you. This is the team I want to go with um, tomorrow. I feel bad that I have to leave people out the squad without really seeing you or anything, but this is what I'm going to do. And I was in that starting the We played West Ham away. We were on a bit of a bad run and we went to West Ham and we, we crushed them. We played some amazing football. Yeah, I, remember that I played in a back in a back four, but was expected to play inside as a kind of server with the ball, play forward, which for me suited me down to the ground. Yeah. So instantly I'm thinking, okay, this is where I'd want to be. And I was playing really well, like playing very well, enjoying it. And 60, 70 minutes, um, tried to make a tackle, foot got caught underneath me. And I've injured my ankle badly. So I come off, um, I'm gutted because I know it's something semi-serious. Yeah. And I've just started the first game playing well. It happens. Uh so I'm at home on the sofa watching TV, feeling sorry for myself. Ice is on the foot, whatever. And my phone starts ringing. And I'm like, it's an unknown number. A FaceTime from an unknown number. I'm like, who is this? So I answer and it's Jose. And the reality is like, we'd never had that level of communication with Portugal. Because he TV just arrived. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but he just arrived yeah. and he's on FaceTime with me. <laughs> he's, uh, he's sat at home in an office, glasses on. He's his first words, can I swear? Or maybe not. Yeah, you can. You, yeah, you yeah, could yeah, swear. Yeah. They can beep it. Yeah. First words to me are, are you <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, yeah, yeah, I think I am. And he was like, ah, ah this is how I wanted to go. Duh, duh, duh. But even to have that level of engagement uh, with someone of his like presence, yeah. that's someone I'd always looked up to as a, like, a, a guy in world football. It was, it was really quite cool, really quite, uh, humbling really so I have to say he was he was brilliant with me I was injured for three months three to four months with an ankle injury and he kept me involved he was always in contact with me and it's pretty easy look the injured guys if you're out for three months then you're not you yeah, don't you always don't really, feel like part yeah, of it yeah, yeah. but he so. was he was brilliant with me kept a complete like conversation and dialogue with me the whole way through was desperate to get me back and yeah, I I have nothing but praise for that man. He, he's, he's certainly somebody who goes out of his way to build that individual yeah, the man relationship. Management side of it. The man management, he was incredible. And look, I probably don't speak for everyone because we do know that he has fallen yeah, out yeah. with people yeah. over time. But for me, from a personal point of view, I loved it. He he once told me um, when 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 I spoke to him for, for for the book I wrote the years ago with General Gavialli, he said like the. Key to my management is just knowing the person you're talking to because and here's two players from yesteryear. I can go to if I can go to John Terry and say, Hey, you're a bad word, you let the team down, you suck, I should get rid of you. And then he'll respond to that by working harder. If I say that to William Gallus, he's gonna punch me in the face and leave the team. I, is that I mean, go looking forward to when you become a coach. Could you, do you see yourself talking differently to different people based on their personalities? Or is that not you? Because you couldn't do the macho Mourinho, like, hey, you look. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. You're all about positive forward, reinforcement. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a time and a place for when someone needs to be told. But, and, and I think he was very smart with it. He knew what was going to get people going. I think with me personally, didn't, he knew that he didn't need to hold anything back. He could be honest with me and I would do what was expected I, that's my character that's how i am and yeah. and it, it, i think that's probably why he respected me was because ultimately i was 
he's my manager i work for you you're like that's whatever you want i will do for this team and and we had a good relationship and we still speak now because of it but you know that's that worked for some players didn't work for others and i think that uh that probably in the end was uh what what went wrong at the club I was going to ask you what do you think went wrong then because he could have worked well he was a winner on the, certainly on the short term he could have brought success to this club and in the end there was clearly something missing yeah we had a uh, it always goes but we were we were top of the league in December and we played Liverpool away we were 1-0 up we played at the time the perfect game we were solid we had chances we missed yeah. a couple of big one-on-ones and we conceded a set piece in like the 90th minute drew one all And from then on, it, that was our top of Christmas moment. Yeah, yeah. And I think then it was like we were chasing results, we were chasing people, and it became a little bit uh, difficult. That's all. And uh, I remember I was, I was injured actually, building up to the cup final, and um, yeah, I missed it. And yeah, they, they, the club chose to change the manager before that. Hmm. I mean, after Jose Nuno came, so I don't know if you learned. A bit from Nuno, or if you had a f- whatever you can tell us, but it felt like, well, sometimes you get some right, sometimes you get some wrong yeah. as a you know two appointed manager, and this one felt like, yeah. Look, I think uh, the same t- same thing for me again. New manager comes in, it's about trying to show your best yeah. self, give what you can to the team, and hopefully you're playing. And Nuno clearly wasn't my biggest fan. I think I started <laughs> one game just before he left the club, so. Yeah. Look, that was probably the one period where I didn't play any games for a while. But thankfully for me, from personal level, it was. Did you only, have any explanation? Eight games. Did, did you understand? No, no, did no. you know? I, I I thought I was training well. I thought I was doing well week in week out, and then I just got dropped in for one game, and it was it was the last game before before he left. Yeah. So, look, from from my point of view, I think as we've said so far, some work out, some don't, yeah. and it was someone that didn't really fancy me at that time, and. That's okay. Football's a game of opinions. I, I still was very professional. I still gave my all. I was still ready to play if I was called upon, but uh, it wasn't for me. Yeah. Business picked up pretty quickly with the next manager after that. <laughs> <laughs> Business did pick up very quickly, it, yeah. <laughs> it also felt from the outside that, you know, and also it happens when you're losing and obviously you get, everything seemed kind of slightly depressing and kind of lower energy. And then, so again, from the outside, Conte between his first seasons is he was kind of like the live wire who like yeah he came in and he was he changed the place instantly it was all of a sudden we didn't have a choice not to be energized he <laughs> came in and he was intense from day one we were working on our tactical shape one we hadn't really played before um i remember we had a meeting everybody's team everybody's names are on the uh, on the whiteboard My name's in two positions, left wing back, left uh, center back. And he was like, we'll go outside, we'll work on this and we'll see who fits where, whatever. And again, a similar type of thing. Two days before a game, he came in and we had to do it. And uh, I was on the pitch and I remember saying to him, look, I think I played there for Wales a lot and really like playing there. I was like, I can be third center back in this system. I, I like playing center back, I know how to do it. And he was like, yeah, trust me, I know that. He's like, I'd like to see you like an Azpilicueta type of player for me who was you know, reliable, can do the job. From that moment, I think I played every game that year yeah. for him. So, as we said, football's a game of opinions. And yeah. look, that He came in and, wow, we changed our team instantly. We were, not only were we solid, but we were we were scoring goals. We were, we were dominating games and in a system that was very similar to how we used to play at Chelsea, but it worked for that period. And we, but, end of the season, we, we beat Norwich, I think, the last day. It was... Yeah. It was a similar type of feeling to that Pochettino feeling where you got on the pitch knowing you're winning today. Really? Yeah. It was that, yeah, that yeah, yeah. We, we got that. We got that so ingrained in a system that we knew was going to work. We felt confident it was, yeah, yeah it was winning. This is where team. an Arsenal fan would crack a stupid joke and say, oh, you forgot that you were Spurs. Like, yeah, ha, ha, ha. But, no, but um, you were fighting with them for that, obviously, top four Yeah, finish. we had that big game yeah. at home where it was, uh, where we won 3-0, Three, I think. Yeah. And obviously the 10 men situation helped us that game but it was that same thing we, we kind of were in a build up to that Arsenal game knowing that okay we win this we'll get Champions League and we went on this run and yeah. we were we were so confident with Conte at that moment that 
we knew we, we were going into that game we felt like yeah okay we'll get this done tonight in terms of tactical aspect of the game was it the one that worked you out the most do you personally but collectively more than Poch more than Jose he was more than no driven. he's incredibly tactically driven I think every game we'd work for three four days on our tactics on our formation how the opposition are going to attack us how we want to attack different roles different players and he was a genius when it came to that he'd really? stand in the middle of the pitch take every training session and be able to see every movement he, he was an expert when it came to that formation and that style and and now that I'm doing my coaching seeing what he was able to do in the middle of the pitch and the actions on the right side of the pitch and him being able to tell the left wing back or the left where defender where you went wrong he, he had eyes in the back of his head really? and tried, it was it was amazing to see and in that system we were everyone knew exactly what was expected of them you said it was sorry before we up. you said the intensity was it the same intensity that Poch had, that Jose had, or slightly different in the sense that I don't know? I, I mean, I don't know if you can have different intensities, but was it... Was you it, definitely can. Can you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think with Poch, it was uh, the whole week was intense. You train how you play. That's the level we're going to hit every single day, whereas Jose was like, why waste our energy yeah. before we play the big game on the weekend? I want everybody fresh. If people are on different injury protocol schedules throughout the week if people need to do different things to get ready for the game this is how we do it and Conte was a bit of a mix of the two Conte is a bit of the mix of the two that's probably a good way yeah. to put it I think we used to train very hard and we were very fit we used to do a lot of running without the ball mm. but not to that intensity that Pochettino was maybe one hour tough session crazy session and then you're done Conte could be a very long session but very tactical driven and also very fitness driven. Yeah. We do a lot of kilometers under him. Really? Yeah. I'm going to say this with, with, with the greatest respect, but as you know, we talk, talked about both beforehand about, you know, Massimo Mato was a very gifted player in the 1980s. He kind of wrote a book about playing with three geniuses, as he put it. And in his case, it was Zico, Michel Platini, and Diego Maradona. These are the three teammates that he had, and he started with some whatever. You you played with Gareth Bale, Harry Kane, and Hongman Son. And before people, trolls come out, please, I'm not saying that that Sonny is the same as Maradona <laughs> or the Harry Kane, you know, but whatever. Yeah. But but this is this is something would, where would there be your three top, top, top? Yeah. Hey, yeah. And I and I'm and I'm curious about that because you talked about your evolution as a player. You're also somebody who I think anybody's seen you play, you you try to think a lot and you're always athletically prepared. Like those are the two things yeah. that you know, you can control, right? You yeah. you may not be a sprinter. You may not have the touch of Gareth Bale, but, you know, you can improve in that. But like the, uh, the other stuff. But I'm not Gareth Bale, Harry Kane, <laughs> often with so Exactly. It's fair. You know, right, there don't, you go. Don't I said it on the bush. Not yet. You're only 30. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> Hang on. Is there anything these three have in common other than being very gifted at the game of football? Because we, we often talk about it, right? About mm -hmm. like, so the winning mentality. Michael Jordan, blah, blah, blah. I hate to lose. Viewed from the outside, not knowing them. Mm hmm and and I'm not going to go down the Gareth Bale golf stereotype yeah, yeah. or whatever but viewed from the outside they strike me as people who view defeat contrary to people who hate losing and go demented when they lose like mm -hmm. perhaps Antonio Conte right they strike me as kind of people who like if they lose if they suffer a setback for example they say I'm going to learn from this I'm going to come back better I'm going to analyze myself viewed from the outside uh, that's my view I am I wrong or um None of these people seem like egomaniacs, first of all. They're not egomaniacs. And to be honest, all three of them, they're great people aside from the football. And I think one thing, maybe it's not the self-analysis after a defeat. It's the mindset of, I'm going to change this. It's not the, you know, a lot of us would look at our games. Where can we improve? Where can we do this? They would take the game by the scruff of the neck. And the next one they're on the field, it's, it's me that can change the outcome of the next one. And we saw that time and time again when I played with Gareth for Wales, the amount of times he's gotten us out of a hole. It's not, let's wait for someone else or the team to play well to do this. He's like, just give me the ball, I'll do it. But this is also recognition really? of the ability. But, because if you, I mean, with all, I say it was the greatest respect, yeah, if yeah. you were Chris Gunter said, oh wait, let me dribble five guys, let me shoot from the halfway line and score, yeah. like Chris Coleman would be like, all right guys, all right, enough, yeah, come on. right? Off we come. So <laughs> there's some level of these yep. people are very aware of their ability of what they can do. I think so, yes. But I, I don't I don't think that ego plays out in the sense that 
it's every time give me the ball. There's never any criticism of teammates for not being good enough. It's just a, I'm going to help the team the best way that I can by being the best player. Does that make sense? It's yeah. a bit weird, but yeah, yeah, in the yeah, sense no, no. of like, they are, they all have so much ability and all of it is, it, it's worked on. You know, they, they're all, they obviously have natural ability, but these guys are the ones who you see shooting every single day after training. And it's no coincidence when you see Sonny cutting in from the right and whipping it in the top corner that it's, he's just done that. He's been practicing that every day after training since I've known him. He's So these three are also among the hardest trainers that you've played Some with? Some of the hardest. I could put maybe Gareth. Or maybe, Gareth wouldn't mind <laughs> okay. me saying he's not the hardest trainer. Right. But, but when the other comes, two. When it comes to the skills and the yeah. actual, the practice of the skills, the being like the shooting that. or the crossing or the free kicks, like Gareth was... One of the hardest workers. Well, when I look at this trio, just thinking mm-hmm. it's a trio, again, viewed from the outside, I would say Son is a phenomenal athlete. I would say Gareth Bale is a phenomenal athlete. Kane does not jump out at me as somebody who is, obviously, he's a very good athlete, mm-hmm. but he's not somebody whose athleticism is the main driver. Is that fair? Yeah, I think that's fair. I think Harry is incredibly strong and sub- like deceptively strong. You don't see many people ever really knock him off balance on the pitch he's yeah he's but if there's incredible. a decathlon and but it's yes, Kane I, and Gareth Bale I, I'm going to pick Gareth Bale me too <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's fair but Gareth is a freak of an athlete that guy is so fast he could just kick it past anybody and get the other side but these guys so driven real real down to earth team players that's a big thing that comes into it I think they all know that you can't do it all alone that's the reality of football. You've seen so many teams where you've got one player who's exceptional and it doesn't work because he tries to do everything. They've all bought into the team side of the game. Maybe they get the rewards for the goals or the assists or whatever, but ultimately they know the team is important as well and they've all shown how important the other side of the game is. When I, when you see Gareth playing for Wales, he, he works his nuts off defensively. Yeah. He's at every corner, winning the ball. Try, he's in the wall, trying to stop everything. Harry's exactly the same, off the ball. Sonny's back, sometimes playing left back, chasing back. And they're all honest players that want the best for the team. And like I said, they're exceptional players and they can sometimes take that team. And you've, the you've seen them level. grow as well. Mm-hmm. So Gareth with, I mean, Gareth be- the Gareth before Real Madrid and Gareth at Real Madrid who wins all those Champions League finals up for he's a he's a better fo- footballer for it. Even even the criticism must, must yeah. have made him stronger. To be fair, yeah. Look, uh, some of the stuff that Gareth used to tell us about Real Madrid is enough for some people to never want to play football again. Really, but for him it was water off duck's back. Uh, he was able to. I don't know how he was able to do it, but he was able to brush it off. Full belief in his ability. Full knowledge that I can still do it still a good player if they don't like me that's their problem that's crazy Harry from the number 9 the, cl- the clinical finisher that you saw became maybe the best number 9 and number 10 in the Premier League yeah. because the goals are great and there's a lot of top goals correct. but to be the goal that number 9 but also being able to be so creative with the ball yeah. when dropping deeper it's mad that was like a that was something he seemed to just pick up that didn't seem like it was yeah. there that was not the thing you saw when you as a young player but when with Mourinho yeah, and some of the passing, some of the it was like a quarterback playing, and uh, and he he was dropping deep, picking the long balls out. Uh, incredible, incredible football player. Someone to develop a game in that way is is insane. And and Sonny coming from Germany, and again, you know, maybe the the star was just getting used to this league and the culture, the language, which was having a big barrier for him compared to the other two to finish Premier League top goal scorer. And to be the player that he's become now must yeah. have been incredible to to witness even. Yeah, Sonny's one of my best friends and he? like we've played together for ages. He's the godfather of my son. He is the man, but he is, you know, he's worked. Yeah. Like if you probably look at the other two, they were both so natural. Harry could strike a ball. I'm not saying Harry didn't work when he's fin- like I said, finishing every day, hitting it. But Sonny, from day one, the technical aspect, working with his dad as a kid. Yeah. When he arrived at Spurs, it was left foot, right foot, gym work. His whole life is dedicated to football. And if anybody deserves the success he's having, it's him. Purely because of 
that effort that he puts in. Mm. His life is dedicated. He has a whole country that, like, the pressure behind him to perform every single week is is insane. Yeah. But he turns up and he's really thriving this year, I think, as captain of the team. He's got that responsibility. He's one of the hardest workers in training every day. And, look, what an incredible player. Yeah. The goals, you, the left foot, right foot, insane. So, no, I was going to say, so them three are in your... Five, I was going to say five aside, but I hate five aside. This okay. is not football. It's for you English people. You shoot from the halfway line. You shoot from your own goal. It's not for me. I'm a purist. So I'll have a seven aside team, okay? Oh, wow. okay. It's better. So in goal, I really expect my boy Hugo Lloris, but it's your choice. Hugo gets in there. Yes. Come on, he's played there for years with me behind him. I'll put him in there. What, so what, he's the cat. <laughs> what kind of relationship you had with him? What, what, what could you say about Hugo? Hugo is just... Another one of those guys who, when I arrived, was like a mentor that he was the club captain and led the team for 10 years until he left now. And he was just, just a calm guy. He wasn't a shouter. He wasn't a screamer. He wasn't a guy who used to take over the dressing room with his personality, but a real you know, performer week in, week out. And some of the saves, you would just turn around mm-hmm. expecting the net to ripple and somehow he'd get there. I agree. We'll, we'll let we'll let Ben, since he's taking his coaching badges, decide the uh, formation. Oh, I know it's two one three. Yeah, two one three. Yeah, two one three. Yeah, two, one, three. So we have a back three two. Attackers. I put you in my back two. Your back two. All right, I can tag along to the ball. Right. right now. So okay. I need yeah. another defender, please. Another defender. Um, who am I going to put? I'm going to go. It's not ideal for the. Actually, I would pick on. I'm gonna put Jan Vertong in there. Nice. So left foot, but but Jan was. You're gonna make him play on the right, yeah. Yeah, well, he can. I don't know. He can play anyway. He was so good. He was. Uh, he was an incredible footballer with the ball. Some of the stuff. He, he, it's like a midfielder. He was so yeah. creative in training. He'd pull off skills and stuff that you wouldn't believe. But but just a real good guy to have in your team. Brilliant on the ball. Solid defensively. I like Jan. So you have one midfielder, obviously. And we know the front three, so really it's him. And you can go attacking mid, defensive mid. You can have a Dembele, you can have a Dele there. You can have whoever you want, I'm Joe gonna, Allen. I'm going to put uh, Christian Eriksen in Ah, no. Nice. I think we talked about him earlier. The same thing I said. He's the manager on the pitch, dictates the tempo, runs the game. Incredible right foot. Christian's in the middle. Perfect. So then, obviously, Bale. Kane and Son, which is a pretty, pretty strong three. <laughs> on your bench. Not that we want to, you know, yeah. put. And you've support. managed to only pick Spurs players so far, by the way. Yeah, that's okay. Well, well, I, have been yeah, there. I have been yeah, there for like 10, ten years, years yeah. to be fair. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I guess Joe Allen would be on the bench. Joey Alves, I must peak. I might put Loudrop on the bench as a player. He could probably, <laughs> he could probably turn up and play that guy. Ah, <laughs> oh, that's a lovely yeah. team, man. And who's your manager then? It could be Cookie Coleman, to be fair, but. Yes. Cookie Coleman. Yeah, go on. Oh, Cookie, Cookie Coleman. He's going to love that as well. The Welsh yeah. hero. Lovely. Lovely.